Well, as you're sitting down, I just want to say one of our core values here at True North is that we serve all. And that's why city serve is so important to us. And I just want to reiterate, Pastor Brandon already talked about it. Today is the day that we can sign up as we begin to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. And so I just want you to take this opportunity. Don't miss it. God will revolutionize your perspective of the world when you begin to serve. Can I get an amen? Amen. So here's what I want you to hear. I've never met a person who said, I want to destroy the trust and love of all the people that are most important to me. I've never met anybody that has said that. And yet this situation, the destruction of the trust and love of the people that we care about most happens way more often than we can imagine. See, there's a real intangible battle taking place all the time. And the sinister part of this battle is it's not a physical battle. It's a battle in between your ears. It isn't a direct attack. It doesn't activate our fight or flight mentality. No, it's way more subtle. It shows up when you're scrolling through social media. It shows up when you're standing in front of the mirror. The battle creeps in when you're watching your kids play sports. It's a battle of the comparison game. My guess is you know that battle. And oftentimes it can affect how we spend our money. What entertainment we pursue can often affect how we spend our time with the opposite sex and what products we consume. When we live in the battle of constantly comparing ourselves to others, our hearts and our minds become captivated by the love of the world. I want you to say that with me. The love of the world. John the Beloved or John the Revelator, it's, it, he's the guy that he says Jesus loved the most because he wrote about it in the book of John. And then he wrote some other books in the Bible, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then the book of Revelation that ends the whole Bible. He has some advice to us about how we need to battle the pull of the world. Everybody say this, I am here to do battle. So I want you to hear this from 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires are passing away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. See, the battle that every one of us fights will be the focus of where we give our love. Do we love God or do we love the world? Do we love Jesus or do we love sin? Dallas Willard, one of the best authors and thinkers of our day, argues in his book, The, the Divine Conspiracy, Jesus didn't invite us to the gospel of sin management. Jesus invited us to a gospel of sin eradication. If you don't know what that word means, it means that sin is eliminated from our lives. And in our culture, we oftentimes rationalize that if I have a little bit more of Jesus and a little bit less of the devil, then I'm moving in the right direction. But friends, Jesus didn't die and was raised to life and sits at the right hand of the Father so we could live a life of compromise. He didn't make a deal with the devil. Jesus destroyed the devil. The devil has no future, so now he is trying to ruin and destroy our lives. He wants us to believe that we cannot have freedom from brokenness and sin. And friends, the reality is too often we stop short of the fullness of God's promises because they seem too costly to our life of comfort. John starts this section of his letter in chapter two with these verses, and I want us to listen to them. John chapter two, verse one says this, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So I want to move forward with this clarity. John is writing this letter to help us 
fight against sin. And the desire of his heart is to communicate that we have someone on our behalf called the Holy Spirit that is working to help us not be held captive to a life of sin and brokenness. And so friends, listen to this. The thing that can hold us captive in this life is a love, a love of sin, is a life of sin, is a love of the world. Sin steals our peace. It causes us to miss our calling and it destroys the people that we love most. Today, if we find ourselves in a life that is in bondage to sin, I want you to hear this. We have an advocate with God, our Father, and it is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He paid our debt, and there's nothing we can do to cause God to love us less or to cause God to love us more. Jesus calculated the cost when he went to the cross. That rhymed, and I didn't even know it, okay? Anyway. There was a complete and total understanding of the work that he was going to accomplish when he laid down his life. And as Pastor Stephen talked about last week, it was his love, his passion that held him on the cross, that kept him there so that all of humanity could have freedom. He could have called heaven to his rescue in a moment. But his love for humanity and creation was greater, listen to this, was greater than his need to defend himself. So he took our sin upon himself and he destroyed it. Praise God. That's an amen moment right there. <laughs> but it leaves us with, the, with an issue. What do we do with the sin that we see in our world today? And even deeper, how do we keep living in victory with Christ ourselves? See, I believe John lays out a forefront battle that the enemy is trying to attack us in in this passage of scripture. And so today, I want to cover those things and I want to describe what it looks like to, le to live a life free from sin. So let's go back in John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So the first battlefront that you and I have to fight is the love of the world. So how do we characterize or describe the love of the world? It's not loving the earth or loving the totality of humanity, but if our love for those things is greater than our love for God, those are sins. No, we're talking about a spirit that is prevalent in our culture and has been since the beginning of time. It's an anti-God spirit. Think of it like this, our world system is God ignoring? And it's like we say he doesn't exist, or if he does, he's certainly not worthy of following. The spirit of the world tempts us to believe technology, governments, and economies can be the savior of humanity. If we trust in these things, everything will get better. But friends, if we use these things separate from God, we cannot save ourselves. Listen to this. The world can make man better off, but it can never make humanity better. I'm going to say that again. The world can make man better off, but it can never make humanity better. Simply put, we like being better off instead of being better it is easy to fall in love with the world. What does the world desire? The world desires our love because if we love the world, we fall in love with what the world can give us. Status, comfort, attention. We all pursue these things instead of pursuing relationship with God. Loving the world is a consistent pursuit of shiny things. Anybody ever had that happen? They don't satisfy. Here's what the world does. It overpromises and underdelivers. 
And if we find our value in cars and houses and our net worth and our prestige and our comfort, the things that we find in this world, we're going to find ourselves in love with the world instead of in love with God. And friends, there's nothing wrong with having things. But if these things tend to take your attention away from God, well, you are in dangerous territory. The love of things will separate you from what God desires to have in your life. And this is why we need to be so careful about the things that we have. How we live our lives is teaching our family, our children, and our neighborhood about what it looks like to love God or to love the world. And if we're living this way, the way of acting like stuff, government, technology, and status can save us, we are not in relationship with God, friends. We are captive to the spirit of the world. Pastor Susie Silk suggests that we should ask ourselves these questions when we begin to look at our resources and our stuff. Does it help me? Does it heal me? Does it fill or satisfy me? And can it sustain me? Does it help me? Does it heal me? Hello? Does it fill or satisfy me? And can it sustain me? See, the solution to this type of captivity, the solution to being set free from the love of the world, is we have to have a bigger story. We have to understand that God is bigger than the stuff in our closet, than the watches on our dresser, than the cars in our garage. Jesus prayed specifically, let them be in the world, but not of the world. Let me say this again. It isn't wrong to have stuff. It's wrong for stuff to have you. John goes on to lay out the battle plan of Satan. And friends, his tactics haven't changed since the Garden of Eden. And the sad thing is humanity continues to fall for the same old tactics time and time again. Here's what John says. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So we're going to walk through these other three battlefronts that you and I have to fight. So what is the pride of life? When Satan approached Adam and Eve in the garden, how did he first appeal to them? He said, surely this food is good to eat. So the battle of the flesh is a battle of acceptance and how we are viewed. Will we choose comfort or will we choose courage? Following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It will not only cost you moments of comfort, it might result in a life that is uncomfortable until you go to heaven. A life that doesn't allow us to simply go with the flow. As followers of Jesus, we will oftentimes find ourselves running in the opposite direction. See, the love of the world is so sneaky because it's that salesman that walks up to you as you're looking at a new car and says, of course you need the heated massage leather seats. You work so hard, you need your back to feel good. Don't tell me you haven't fallen for that temptation anyway, okay? See, as a recent college graduate, I had a degree, but I had no money. You know that type of college graduate? But I told myself, self, you've accomplished something. You need something nice. See, I was making $200 a week as a part-time youth pastor, and I was slinging pizza for Papa John. Can I get an amen? I had a Chevy long bed that had come directly out of a farmer's backfield. It was a 1990 Chevy long bed. It was sky blue. The radio whistled when you drove because the connection was bad. And it was paid for. And I said to myself, I'm going to trade that truck in for a thing of beauty. It was a 1999 GMC Z71 short bed stepside. Can I get an amen? All right. 
had that dual exhaust. But friends, can I tell you, that was a fleshly decision. And eight months later, at 23 years old, I'm going to my father and saying, Dad, I need your help. I cannot afford this truck. So I traded it in for an Oldsmobile Alero. Praise God. (laughs) Couldn't even fit in that thing. (laughs) Friends, the reality is every single one of us has made that choice. The choice that draws you away from loving Jesus The choice where our heart is on the verge of sin. That is the lust of the flesh. What's the lust of the eyes? I mean, I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory, but Satan showed Eve that the food was pleasant to the eye. See, we see things with our eyes that cause us to desire them. That's why social media is so dangerous. Social media has filters that can take somebody that doesn't look so great and make them look amazing and what they're looking at is totally fake. And fellas, if you don't know this, you are a visual creature. Newsflash, okay? And many of the men in the room make this rationalization. I looked, but I didn't touch. Now I'm gonna start stepping on toes. Jesus felt very differently about how we used our eyes and how we fight this temptation of the lust of the eyes. I want you to listen to this from Matthew chapter five, verse 27. You have heard that it is said, you should not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust in lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. And throw it away from you, for it is better for you to lose one part, one of the parts of your body, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Why is loving the world so dangerous? Because it causes us to rationalize our sin. Jesus said, you, you've heard it said, you shouldn't commit adultery. But I'm telling you, if you look for longer than three seconds... You're committing a sin. Andrew Huberman, a biologist and professor and a lecturer from Stanford, recently said this, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a movie is worth a million pictures. What you're looking at, what you're thinking about, and what you're watching can cause you to store thoughts and images in your mind and in your brain that will be there forever and can be a source of ongoing sin. So guard your eyes. Don't walk around talking about all the baddies you see. For anybody over 40, that means a lady that's pretty, okay? (laughs) And ladies, take it easy, okay? (laughs) On the same hand, don't fall for the rom-com with the guy who has the six-pack abs. They're not always available, but this guy is, (laughs) okay? It's called the North Dakota Tan Lines. Praise God. All right. (laughs) You know, those rom-coms that portray the perfect man ever. That man doesn't exist. He's a made up fantasy. Here's what God tells us. Whatever is pure, whatever is holy, think about these things and you will find life. Don't live in fantasy land. Live a fully present life with God and with the people around you. What's the pride of life? Simply put, everything that we have is from God. And the moment that we start to count our chickens, pat ourselves on the back on how well we've done, friends, that's dangerous territory. See, the pride of life causes us to get puffed up and to view God as smaller in our eyes. But that's not true. God never shrinks because of our perspective. Satan told Eve that the fruit would make her wise. He appealed to her pride. She was thinking about how differently the world would view her. And friends, have I fallen victim to this sin so many times? 
And I want you to hear this, by no means is this a humble brag, but I have two degrees on my wall, both from higher education places that says Mike has a bachelor's and Mike has a master's. And the man that I encountered last week that was homeless could care less about how much I knew. He wanted to know if I could meet his need. He didn't care about how successful I am. See, Jesus is the reason that I have accomplished anything in life, and it's the same for you. Don't let pride convince you that you are above needing God, or you're above his grace, or that you're above needing boundaries. Anyone can have a weak moment. Anyone can make a bad choice. And that choice could potentially burn everything down around you. Let me end with this. A great sin can cause a man to lose all his worldly possessions. But a small sin can make a man miserable. Jesus came to set us free from this type of life. A life of misery or a life where we destroy everything. He doesn't desire us to be miserable or to lose everything because of sin. I wanna be very clear. It doesn't mean that we aren't gonna suffer. It doesn't mean that life isn't gonna be hard, but Jesus came to free us from sin being the cause of that. Jesus came to give us life and life abundant. So stop letting sin hold us captive. If it was that easy, right? Just to say, oh, I'm gonna stop letting sin hold me captive. It'd already be done. Amen? Here's what I want you to hear today. Jesus is the only one that can help us overcome sin. Jesus is the only one that can help us, that can heal us, that can fill us, that can satisfy us, and that can sustain us. And Satan wants us to believe that the world can fulfill all those things. But guys, that is a lie from the pit of hell. So maybe you're asking yourself today, what can I do? Well, I want to invite you to do the most courageous thing ever. I want you to admit that you can't do it on your own. I'm sure you can tell by my tan lines, I was in the sun recently in that picture. <clears throat> we were out on the boat with a, an accountability group that I'm a part of. And as we we're pulling the boat into the dock, it was a 36 foot boat. And I was on the bow and my job was to stop it. Now, I'm fairly strong, okay? You can tell, all right? But that boat weighs tons and tons and tons. And the guy that got out of the boat pushed it off and then it rocked back. And I was standing at the very front trying to stop it from an I-beam and I couldn't. And it scraped the front of the boat. Friends, many of you are me standing at the front of the boat saying, I can withhold sin. You're white knuckling it. You're fighting the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life on your own strength. And here's what I want you to hear. Jesus has come to set you free. Jesus has come to set you free. And you don't have to live in bondage for one more moment. So I'm gonna ask you to stand up with me right now. I'm going to take a drink. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. First, I, I just want you to know, I'm going to ask you to respond to asking Jesus into your heart today. And if you're already following Jesus, yes and amen. But if you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus today, now is your opportunity. And here's what I will also want you to hear. It, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and that might feel uncomfortable, but if you can't raise your hand in a room full of believers, then you certainly aren't gonna raise your hand when you're out in the world. Amen? And so we don't walk in fear, we walk in freedom and Jesus has come to set us free. So let's bow our heads right now. And if Jesus is speaking to you about the battle you are fighting in your own strength, and today you wanna ask Jesus to be the leader of your life, would you just raise your hand? Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, God. 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 Yes, amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Jesus. God is setting people free right now in our midst. 
So I want us to all repeat after me, okay? Father God, forgive me for living a life away from you. Today, Jesus, I repent for the love of the world, for the love of the flesh, for the love of the eyes, and for the pride of life. Father, ground me in your truth. Be my leader and lead my life. We thank you, God, today. You know what's appropriate right now? A round of applause. Come on. Not pastor math, real math. I counted at least 12 people that raised their hand right now. Amen. And I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for making that decision. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing. Amen. And let's sing like it matters today because our praise gives God the ability to come close to us. Can I, can I get an amen? Amen. Worship is how we fight our battles. So, Father God, we give you thanks today. Jesus, I thank you for the amazing people in this room, those that have said, God, I want you to lead my life. I want you to transform my life. God, I don't want to live the life of comparison any longer. I don't want to be caught up in the desires of the world. I want my heart to be made new by following after you. Lord Jesus, would you be glorified in this house today? Would your name be the name on our lips and the one who controls our mind and controls our hearts? And Father, we'll follow after you all the days of our life. Jesus, you are good. We love you today, God. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing.